is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and minds to receive the word of God. Make us good soil. Lord, we pray we receive only what is from you, God. I pray you weed out any false doctrine, any false teaching. And we only hear your voice. We listen to your will. And Lord, change us through this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we had a great retreat. Sorry you all couldn't make it. Next time. Next time. Um, so we had several people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, also oh, and a salvation and yeah. baptism and, yeah. and people getting free. And that's, you know, really that is the way it's supposed to be. If I could do it that way, that would be church every Sunday. Um, because if you look at the original structure of the church, it was in a house, and that's exactly what ha was happening to people. They were getting healed, delivered, they were getting baptized wherever there was water, and um, we miss that when we come into a structured institution. Anyway, back to this. So, uh, one of the themes I was trying to address on the, on the retreat was, it was in 2 Corinthians um, 6, 17-18. That God is our Father, but He says, come out from sin. So there's a process of repentance that, uh, that leads to the outflow of God's love and His forgiveness. And I sent out a video from Derek Prince. Uh, if you guys, not a video, a YouTube thing. What's well, a video? <laughs> um, on his experience of casting out demons out of people. And many of these demons that came out were... A f were talk were, they had been associated with ministries, well-known pastors who were spirit-filled. And it's interesting that what I think is happening when these things happen, there's a partial truth in what's being revealed in the teaching, but then there's another part that we're not quite getting. So, for instance, if I pre preach to you about salvation through the gospel of Jesus, and I emphasize uh, repentance of sins and the baptism in water, but I leave out the baptism of the Holy Spirit and walking in the Spirit and the miracles of God. I make an error. I make a theological error. And if I do the opposite, I also make an error. If I emphasize all the gifts of the Spirit and no repentance and nothing of this, that you know, and, or if it's all the love of God and none of the calling to repentance, again, and what is happening is I am leaving territory that's supposed to be covered through the teaching of the Word open for the enemy to occupy, and the enemy will come in and take that part away. So we have to really do our best to cover the full Word of God, the full uh, will of the Lord. Now, I chose these verses in 1 Peter 2, 19 to 21, because it points out there are two ways to suffer as a, as a person, or even as a Christian. And one way is to suffer by being completely consumed by God. That you seek everything that God has to offer. And in your seeking, you try to lead a life led by the Holy Spirit. And you start to stand out from the rest of the world. And you're not giving in to what other people are saying or mocking about Jesus. And you just walk that walk towards God. And you will be persecuted. If you don't give in to false teaching, false gospels, you will potentially be persecuted. We see this in Paul's life. He was all given out for the Lord, and his reward was stonings, uh, shipwrecks, being naked. We talked and smirked about it. At least I did the other day. Um, and, and false brothers and people in the churches talking bad about him, and he ends up in a prison for preaching the gospel. All he ever did was heal people and preach the gospel. And then they killed him. So if you are really sold out for Jesus, you're going to find that this is going to happen. To some measure, you're going to be pushed against. It's happened to me at time, many times, in fact. And it may happen 
particularly in your families. And there's another way. You have two options. You can be persecuted for following Christ with your whole heart, trying to live a holy life, praying for people, witnessing and sharing the gospel, or you can be persecuted for your sins. You can be persecuted for the things you've done wrong. Now that can happen if you break laws in this country and you get caught by the police. You're going to get per you're going to have a pain. You're going to have a suffering that occurs as a result of doing wrong. Now Jesus says you can, you know, I wish you were hot or cold because if you're lukewarm, I just want to vomit you out of my mouth. So there is no middle ground with God. You have to put your foot to the gas and go forward or you're going backwards. You've got to choose to live for the Lord or you're going to be persecuted in another direction. There's a judgment seat. There is a judgment seat. Let me read this and then there's a video I'd like you to see. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 12. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 to 12. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. <clears throat> I want to read one more verse. So, fear of the Lord, judgment seat of Christ. Everyone will receive what is due for what he has done in the body. You have a body, soul, and spirit. The soul is your emotions, your mind, it's your will, it's the, my desire to do this or to do that or what I want. The spirit is given to you by God and it is that holy part, it is, that, it is the spiritual part that enables you to even know there is a God. It is that part that uh, uh, as we yield to it, as the soul yields to the spirit, we begin to become spiritually minded and we begin to act out as spiritual men and women of God and God starts to operate in us and we become aware of his presence and we are able to talk to him, we are able to pray to him and we are also able to listen to the word of God and have it make sense to us. Without the spirit, the soul is operating and it's just all your mind. There's no spiritual aspects. The body is the container in which you act all of this out. Your decisions, your spiritual and your soulish decisions are then manifested in how you do things on this earth. So if you use your body for sin, for sexual immorality, for criminal activity, for whatever it is, for greed, for lust, that is act out and that's from your soul and that's sin. Now if you use your body to reach out, to heal people, to help people, to release love to people, to bring them to Jesus. That is the spirit, the soul releasing itself to the spirit and your actions become giving, serving, pouring out. God starts to pour out of you. But it comes through your body. Remember the, the feet of one bringing good news are blessed. That means you got to go someplace. How are people going to believe unless they hear? And who's going, how are they going to hear unless you tell? So how do you bring the gospel? You use your mouth. You use your body. You use your everything you got. How do you help a poor person? You give them money. You feed them. Right? How do you heal the sick to show that Jesus is alive? You lay hands on them. You pray for them. You have a choice. There's two places to go with this. And you will be judged by it. I will be judged by it. What I do in my body, sexual immorality comes up many times as a sin. And Jesus says, the sexually immoral will not, and Paul says in, in, uh, in uh, I think it's 1 Corinthians, the sexual, uh, sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Liars, drunkards, cowards will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, if we read this the way it's, spo it's written, it's a scary thing. Those sins are very important. 
There, will there be persecution for sin? Yes. One, I can violate a law and the police can put me in jail here. I have to pay a fine. Two, God holds me accountable. I am accountable for what I do in the body. Can I see this, uh, that video? This one really struck me. Um, now, when I tell you this, it's like something distant, something in the future, that I'll be judged someday. Well, you know, do I really have to take it so seriously, or will I take it seriously right now? Well, I was watching this, and I'm thinking, what happens? Is that what it's supposed to be? That's it. If you could expand it out. Uh, the green. Go to the green. What happens when you receive a sentence, a life sentence, or a death sentence, for murdering somebody. What is the reaction? Because I, I was watching some videos about this and I saw the criminals sitting there and they're just kind of, well, oh, no big deal, no big deal. And then all of a sudden the judge stands out and says, guilty of murder, death sentence. Guilty of murder, life sentence. And then let's see what happens. The severity of the blow to that child's leg and to say that you did not recognize what had been done to ignore what must have been the excruciating sounds that came from that child on a daily basis is more than disconcerting to this court. And as such, the court finds it appropriate that each be sentenced to the State Department of Corrections for a period of life. You will get credit for any of the time that you've Does this remind you of a biblical, of some Bible verses? That's Judgment Day. What does Jesus say about Judgment Day? Matthew 23, 25 to 28. Matthew 23, 25 to 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and law lawlessness. That, there's two parts here. I want to read another part. But that first part is, um, we have hidden sin. These people had hidden sin until the police found out. They had beaten a child. I don't know if it was to death, probably. And they, maybe they thought they got away with something. I had a technical glitch. Um, oh, here it is. Okay, I'm sorry. Matthew 22, 13 to 14. Matthew 22, 13 to 14. 
<laughs> then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? Because they never repented of their sins. Never took it seriously that there will be a day of judgment. When these people beat that little child, they weren't thinking about this day. They were just doing whatever their soul wanted them to do. No consequences. There's no consequence with your sin until you're caught and the legal authorities have you and then the judge gives you a sentence. Up until then, you're kind of living in, in a, in a make-believe world, not aware of the consequences. If those people had been aware of the consequences of what they were doing before they did it, do you think this would even have happened? If they could have felt and seen themselves, this video, before they beat that child, and they realize their sin has an impact, has a cost. Do you see what I'm saying? Are we aware of our sin? Do we understand that what we have inside us that we don't deal with is going to be brought up to the judge? This is very clear in Scripture. No one gets off the hook. No one. The blood of Jesus covers us. The blood of Jesus allows grace and forgiveness for our sins. But what is the process to receive it? Acts 2, 30, is it 38 to 30, 36 to 38? Um, well, I remember what it says, but if you want. So, they were cut to the heart when they heard the gospel of Jesus. And they said, what must we do to be saved? What must we do? And the answer Peter gives, re, basically believe in this message, repent and be baptized, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, we must repent. Now, when we first receive Jesus, we say, I'm guilt I feel guilty of my sins. You must have a conviction of sin that says, I need a Savior. Because if you don't know that you have sin, you don't know that you need a Savior. You see? You just say, oh, I just want a good guy. I just, wanna, I just want people to call me a Christian. I want God to love me. He will. He does. But the cost is repentance, the conviction of sin. I cannot go around living like I used to live and have a clean conscience. The sexually immoral will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now the problem we may have is that some of these habits we picked up before we were saved and we never completely got free. Never completely got free. But maybe that sin was never quite pointed out to you clearly. Or you didn't get it, that this is important. I need to get what is important to God. I need to feel it and be convicted of it so that I respond accordingly. I can't do it on my own. 2 Corinthians 7 8 to 11. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, Paul says, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. You see, it's not feeling bad about your sins. That doesn't get you into heaven. It's the repentance of the sin. For you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Whereas worldly grief produces death. <laughs> For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, but also 
What eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves innocent in the matter. When we feel a godly grief that leads to repentance, it produces an action inside us, a reaction inside us. There is a pain inside us about the sin that I no longer want this. I no longer can live with this. I must clean the inside of the cup. I can't go to church anymore living with this thing inside me. It's tormenting me. So you see, when you have not completely repented in a godly way, there is always a grief inside you. There is always a slight separation between you and God. You can't worship the way you want to worship. You can't pray the one you, way you want to worship. You don't feel the full love of God. It's not God's fault. It's our fault because we never brought that convict. We never asked for the conviction of our sins to really bring us to that same grief that that woman was feeling. But you see, that was a worldly grief that she showed in that video. Oh, no. Oh, no. The reality of going to prison for the rest of your life. Oh, no. Oh, no. I would do anything to undo this. But it has nothing to do with God. It has nothing to do with God is my judge and I have harmed the Lord. I have grieved the Holy Spirit. I do not want to live separate from God. It's not just about the consequences for your sins. The consequences are there to discipline us as Christians. So the Bible tells us that God is a godly, a good father, and he disciplines us in love and perfection, not like our earthly fathers who don't know how to do it properly. But God is perfect in His discipline. So if you are in sin and you are having bad things happen to you and you do not feel good about yourself or your life, it could be the Holy Spirit is provoking you, is pointing it out to you. Get rid of it! Get rid of it! You can't live like this anymore. You can't live. It's depressing you. It's ruining your joy. Do you want joy? Do you want love? Do you want peace? So as I started off with the verse in 1 Peter, you can have persecution as a Christian, but if you have repented, if you know your Father is God, if you know and you can feel the love of God, the joy of the Lord, even in persecution, you can be happy. You can be happy in a prison. You can be, as Paul was on multiple times, you can be happy in a financial crisis. You can be happy in a marriage crisis. You can, ha not happy, let me use a different word, joy. You can have peace going through a crisis, a sickness. You can have calmness. That's the difference. It's not about the outward persecution and problems. They will come. Jesus says they will come. But in it, while the storm is all around your boat and it's the high waves and the wind and you've got Jesus sleeping in the back and he's, a, he's not afraid and neither should you be. If you really have faith in Jesus, if you really have repented and you have a real relationship with Him, those waves and those winds will not deter you. You will not be moved. Amen. <coughs> but if you have sin, you don't have the comfort of God with you. There's always this, this fear. This, Am I saved? Most people don't know they're saved because they have sin in their life. If you take out and you repent of these major sins, you will have peace and you'll know the Lord and you'll feel the peace and the, and the acceptance of God. But if you allow sin, that, is, that doubt is there for a reason. It's the Holy Spirit saying, are you sure you're saved? Look at how you're living. You're willing to violate the Word of God because you want to live in sin and have temporary pleasure. Because your friend wants you to do this, or your person in your life wants you to do this, you will doubt. It causes doubt. There is no peace. What we need to do is trade the temporary worldly satisfactions or worldly worries 
for that true repentance, the true confession to God. You can't worship effectively if the Holy Spirit is pointing a sin out to you. It is not possible. And Paul says in Hebrews 12, 1-2, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these are the heavenly hosts and God and everybody else, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy... See, the joy is there that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You will have joy when you say, I am living for Jesus, regardless of the persecution and the cost. But until you get to that point, you're always going to feel like something's holding you down, something's holding you back. And that compromise is actually allowing you to live in sin of some form, whether it's doubt, fear, sexual immorality, greed, less, you know the whole list, lying, whatever it is. You are living in that and you're rationalizing it and you're willing to accept that, but you have no peace, no joy. When Jesus said, I'm all in, I'm living for my Father, I'm living to be obedient. The whole question is obedience. Are you going to obey God? It's not just a set of laws, although He does have them, but it's obeying Him. It's obeying your Father. And He's also the judge. He's also the lawyer. I mean, uh, but he will, he will decide your fate. If you don't know, because the Bible says at one point, it says, no one will ever snatch them out of my hand, indicating you can't lose your salvation. And then in another place, it says in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, you are to deliver this man for sexual immorality, I might point out, incest with his father's wife. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He's talking about a believer who fell into sin. And he's saying maybe he can still be saved. Let him go through a painful circumstance so that he has to repent of his sins. You see, sometimes we baby people. We think it's God's love. That they are caught in a sin. They're caught into a bad pattern of life. And we keep aiding them. There's one person who wanted to stay in my home. And I would normally let this person stay. But this person has a history of not being productive. Doesn't want to get a real job. Is always whatever somebody wants to hand him, he always takes it. And never takes personal responsibility. And this is someone who's actually... A family member. So I had to say, no, he can't stay here. Do you think I was popular in the family? Not a bit. <laughs> Do you think I'm popular with, I don't know about him, but um, that, that's a fact. Now, if God's trying to say, get your act together, and I keep ha handing him out and keep saying, here's a place to stay, here's some money, well, he keeps going that way. And God's trying to say, get him to repent, get him to stop. I want to change. I want to save him. But you keep babying him. Now that's the point that we get to. Sometimes in love, you have to say that's enough. That's enough. Now if that person repents, Paul's very clear. Bring them back. Do not allow them to have more sorrow. Once they repent, you bring them back in. Help them. Love them. Don't separate yourself from them. Because the whole process is love. It's not to harm or judge or put down or laugh at somebody. It's to help God do what he's doing in their life to get them to where they need to be. And it hurts. Isn't it hurtful? Isn't it painful? When we begin to see the consequences of our sin and the pain we cause other people because of it, it, it should hurt. But what people tend to do, they try to medicate. They'll go to drugs, they'll go to alcohol, they'll find video games, some way to escape that thing because they don't want to face it. Look at what I did. I can't live with myself. Now the difference is, unlike this woman who had to go to church for the rest... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe, she, maybe she does. <laughs> maybe she did. Yes. Maybe, maybe she, she did. did. Yeah, maybe 
Yes, he did. Right. Thank you. Thank you for catching yeah. me on that, Maynard. That's right. Maybe that got it to her. But there are a lot of people who don't. So now if she goes, if she goes through that and doesn't come to the Lord, that's just worldly, you know, that's being a sorry for myself. Yeah. But if she says, maybe I need Jesus, right. because that's the answer. If she doesn't, that judge is not going to have any more mercy for her, right? That's done. Yeah. But there's another judge. Amen. Yes. So now her soul is still redeemable. Yes. If she humbles herself and confesses her sins to the real judge, the long, yes. the eternal judge, and repents. Amen. Godly sorrow. It'll lead to a fruit of repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If she, there's, a, there's an amazing story, if you want to look this one up, about the son of Sam. Sam Berkowitz. If you're old enough, you know that. Sorry, Sherry, to point out our ages to people. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, we're not old so, enough. So, Sam Berkowitz. There is the son of Sam murders in New York City. And this guy would walk up to a car and just, he'd shoot innocent people. Lovers parked in the car many times. Killed many people. It was no rhyme or reason. It's all over the city. So they couldn't figure this thing out. Well, son of Sam, Sam Berkowitz, was a troubled Jewish kid that was put up for adoption. Uh, anyway, he had demons his whole life, and he saw the demons, and they spoke to him and had him do things, and he was a whack job. Sorry, I don't know how else, that's not in the Bible, but you get the picture. Uh, and, um, well, he grew up this way, and then he, he met a group of Satanists who used to worship the devil, and the devil actually manifested to them. This was all real. Until he was demonized, and then the, the cult, this leader of the satanic group says, well, the demons are telling us you have to go kill people. So he goes out and he starts shooting people like this. And in court, after they caught him, he was so demonized, he'd just sit there laughing and physical, he could move like four or five men. This is a little guy. And he could move people all over, constant cursing, constant laughing, totally demonized. He goes into prison, and it was actually Times Square Church, David Wilkerson's church that uh, had, I didn't know this until recently, that had a prison ministry. They went in and somebody witnessed uh, to David, uh, David Berkowitz, sorry, David Berkowitz. Yeah. And uh, he was listening, but Sam. It's no, I'm wrong. It's David Berkowitz. Oh. Son of Sam was what they called him. I don't know. Oh, okay. But when they found out his real name, it was David Berkowitz. Well, he opens the Bible. And while he's there, he reads about, I forget which verse, it was one of the Psalms. It might have been 91. I, I don't remember. But it was about God's love for him. And that would, you know, it made him realize that God forgives him. It was something along the lines of Psalm 103, where God forgives all your sins. I forget. And right there, the Holy Spirit touched him and he gave his life to Jesus. And now I've, I've listened to several interviews because it's just one of those amazing stories. He's a real born again, tongue talking Christian. He speaks in tongues. Wow. Now, while he was in the prison, though, someone came up and he indicated that this person was demonized, sent by this satanic group, came and slit his throat from here to here. Wow. And he lived. He has a scar right across. And they were in, in the interview, they were saying, do you want to talk about this event? He said, no, because I know who did it. And if I talk about it, they're going to kill me again. You know, they'll get me next time. So he, he said, you know, people come to me. They write me letters. They want to be encouraged. I, he said, you know, I'm in prison for the rest of my life, and people want to kill me. He said, I have hard days. Some days I feel down. It's hard for me. And, and people don't understand that. They hear my story and they think, it's not easy for me, he said. But look, he goes to the, he's one of the leaders in the prison fellowship. And people go to him because they sense, a, you know, that he, God really changed his life and there's hope for them. So it's not easy for David, but he's got peace, he's got joy. If you listen to him, you can't believe this is the same. It's just remarkable. That's, 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 that's what you call a blessing. A huge blessing. Humongous. He deserves death. Anybody, anybody would say, he, he would say he deserved death, right? But God had mercy on him. Now he's still in jail. But look, this is, it's your long-term salvation that matters because David came face to face with God, repentant, true repentance. So look at what God can forgive. 
<laughs> a Satanist who murdered innocent people, just point blank. That's the mercy of God. But it requires repentance. Yes. David can't go back and associate with those old people. David can't go to a satanic group anymore. David can't play around with guns. David can't be violent anymore. David has to be a true Christian. He has to walk it out. And the Bible tells us that in 1 Corinthians 11, 31 to 32, 1 Corinthians 11, 31 to 32, but if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. David's discipline was going to jail for the rest of his life. David Berkowitz's. King David also was disciplined for his sin, for adultery, the setting up of Guy for murder, the husband of the woman he committed adultery with. The Lord took the baby's life. He didn't let David, King David off the hook <laughs> because David needed that discipline. David needed to be corrected into repentance. Listen, if you're having problems, if bad things are happening because of your sin, don't feel like a victim. And don't say, oh God, please don't let this happen to me. Maybe it needs to happen to you. Maybe you need to feel that pain and you got to say, whoa, I have to judge myself. What I did was wrong. And this is not what God wants me to do. I, I, um, I remember when I first was baptized and coming out of the water, I tell everybody this, I felt washed clean. I had no separation between me and the Lord. I could feel His love. I was squeaky clean inside and outside. I had never felt better in my life. And then as I went along, I sinned. And I could feel that sin come into my life. I'll tell you for sure, I knew it. And I thought, whoa, I don't feel as close to God. I don't feel that joy and that cleanness anymore. Why? Because I have to repent. You know, the day that I was saved, I repented. But then guess what? I committed another sin. 1 John 1, 8 to 9. If we commit our if we say, well, first of all, if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar. We have sin. And, but if we have sin and we confess our sin to God, He is good and will forgive us of those sins. But it has yeah. to be a true confession. It has to be a real repentance. You don't want to live in any form separated from God. You don't. Why? Why? And then every day you've got this gnawing feeling that I'm not right with the Lord. I'm not happy. I am afraid. Am I saved? What's going on? Repent. Get it over with. David Berkowitz can do it. You can do it. Amen. You know? Amen. Just to call on the Lord. If you're sincere, God's more sincere. Amen. But He wants you to open that door so He can come in and complete this job and keep you clean and keep you on the right track. So don't let sin abide in you. If it's there, get on it and get it out. And you know, so we all have a lot of sins. Well, what do you do? How do you know what to focus on right now? Because where do I start? I got a thousand of these things going on. I don't even know them all. I'm committing sins. I don't. So you start off with whatever that big one is that God keeps showing to you that you keep remembering every single day that you don't feel comfortable about. Start with that one. And then you deal with that one. And then the Lord will probably show you something else. <laughs> But don't leave that big one there and just go about your merry way. Because the Lord also says that there on Judgment Day, if I have cast out demons and I have healed the sick, that is no justification for my salvation. And the Lord can say, depart from me, I never knew you. You don't just need to do the miracles. You need to have the character adjustment. Guess what? When you cast out a demon, who's doing it? That's a gift. It's not, it's not your character. Right. If I heal the sick, it's because God's in me and I had faith to release it. But He's healing. Amen. Yeah. It's a gift. Yeah. If I can prophesy, that's a gift. 
What's a gift? It's something that someone else gave me. I did not produce this. God gave it to me. So why would that be your salvation if it came from him? No, what he wants is something out of you. Uh, he wants a change in you. Something you willingly submit to. So you sincerely repent. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about the gifts of the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit on many Sundays. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, kindness, gentleness, blah, you know, the whole nine yards. That's coming out of you as, the Holy, as you yield to the Holy Spirit and you agree and you start to change and you start to repent of your sins. Anything that's not in that list, uh, Galatians 5, 19 to 24, I didn't... Eh. Galatians 5, 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I had warned you before, that's two warnings, <laughs> that those who do such things will not, what? Inherit. What? God. Ouch. Do you think he means what he says? Yes. What about the law book that that woman was shown when she came into the courtroom? Did they mean what they said that you're going to jail if you beat that baby? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was, the react what was the consequence? Life in prison. They didn't say, oh, you look like you feel bad about this. No problem. <laughs> no, God's say. If you continue on and God is warning you and you just keep ignoring that, you run the risk of getting a sentence you don't want at the end of this thing. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You can do as much as that as you want. Hey, and that's good stuff. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's what we're doing. Kill it. Put that thing to death by repentance, by a conviction. I'm, I know this is not always easy. Please, I've struggled with things in my life too. But what I, ought, I am seeking is that God clearly points it out to me, cause me that pain of my soul that I can't live with. Give me no rest until I repent. Don't let me dance along, a happy Christian on the outside and inside. I got all kinds of sin in here and it's killing me because sin causes death. That's what you feel. That's that sadness in you. That's that depression and separation from God. Sin causes death and you have not repented and that's why it's there and we also know from doing deliverance that those demons will operate in us until we repent or until someone comes along and sets us free together it goes together judge yourself before you get to the judge's bar the Bible's filled with these warnings folks and we're kidding ourselves if we have little children Bible studies and we draw pictures of Moses in our head and <laughs> talk about the animals in the ark. Now that, that's not what this is about. This is about sheer terror, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And God, this loving Jesus, is the one who's going to send us there. That's not a joke. That's why Paul says fear of the Lord. <laughs> we need more teaching that goes in hand with the love of God and the fear of God. I need to be convicted of my sin. But David came to the Lord after his sin. And in Psalm 51, hey, if you, wanna, if you don't know how to really pray through a sin, start, you can start with Psalm 51. David wrote this after his adultery, after the murder of Uriah, 
after Nathan the prophet revealed that God knew what David had done. By the way, do you know that God knows your sins and mine? Yes. Just because we didn't come up front here and tell the whole church about it. It's, if God's pointing to a sin in your life, deal with it. I've had people uh, have a dream and they're telling me the dream, and I'm thinking, that's about me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I've got to repent of that. I've got to repent of that. I prayed for someone one time, very godly person, with, together. And as we're praying, I see a belt. And I'm saying, I don't know what this is. And the person goes, I know what it is. When I was young, I stole a belt from my aunt. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, God. Please forgive me. In tears. Now, I don't know what it is, but that person did. Boy, when God speaks, he doesn't all, he'll speak to someone else, so you get the point. There'll be a dream, there'll be a prophecy, there'll be something, but you know it's true. I know when I'm preaching, wow, I mean, it's, people will come up to me and say things I didn't even think about, you know, but God knew when that word is released and the power of God's there. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. See, David knew he needed it. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You see, you can't just read this and be convicted. You need the Holy Spirit. Amen. You've got to pray for the Holy Spirit. Convict me of my sin so I hate it, so that these words mean something and do something in my life. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. If anybody feels like that, you're in this category. David, do you think David was saved? <laughs> so God told Nathan, he said, I'm still going to take the baby. You're still going to be punished for your sin, but I have forgiven your sin. God forgave his sin. But that doesn't mean that Peter and James are joining us right now and <laughs> sending messages. So I'm hearing that. I just lost my... Okay. Um, but David was convicted. So even if God says, I'm going to forgive your sin, you still got to get on it. Mm -hmm. Don't play around with it. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. See, David admitting to the whole world, everybody, that he was guilty. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. Inside am I true to God. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. There's a whole lesson on that, but I won't get into it right now. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. See, he believed in God's ability to forgive and desire to forgive. Through his repentance, he had no doubt that he was forgiven. David Berkowitz knows he's forgiven. Otherwise, he couldn't live with himself. You need to know you're forgiven, and you'll know when you repent. When you repent, it takes away. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan. So if you give him a chance to keep condemning you, he will. That's what's happening. If you allow that sin in his life, he is perfectly right. To, that's his job. To keep pointing out your unconfessed sin. <laughs> And that's that voice you keep hearing. You are going to hell. Does God really love you? You're worthless. You're not a good Christian. You, don't even, you shouldn't even go to church today. So get on it and repent. 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 We have to repent. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me. Only God can create in you a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And see, you feel distant from God until you repent. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. From me. Restore to me. The joy of your salvation. David couldn't fake it. He had to go to God. God, only you can give me this joy, and you'll only give it to me when I repent. And uphold me with a willing spirit, that I want to do your will. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. You will then become the evangelist you're not. Let me tell you that. Because I know when there's sin in my life or in somebody else's, they are not good evangelists. It shuts you down. You don't want to share the Word of God with anybody because you have a sense of shame. 
You know, you said, man, I shouldn't be talking about Jesus to these people. Look at me. And there's something inside you that's like, oh, I just don't feel good about talking about Jesus to these people. You just need to repent. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. Even murder God will deliver us from. Oh God, oh God of my salvation and my tongue. If you do God, he said, my tongue will sing aloud for your righteousness. So people who can't worship, there's something in there that needs to be repented of. Maybe it's an anger towards a parent, an anger towards God, or an anger towards themselves or whatever. But that will shut down your worship. You don't want to worship. I've heard many people tell me that. I can't pray. I can't sing. I can't. It's because of sin. Oh, Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. Some people give money. Some people do deeds to try to be good and get God to like them. It doesn't work. That is not repentance. That's just covering up something that needs to change inside. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Oh, God, I can't live without you. God, what did I do? God, I need you. A broken and contrite heart. You need a new heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. That's what he's looking for. Now, I can do this little sermon here, but unless the Holy Spirit works on your heart, unless you are convicted, unless you want to put things right with the Lord, I can't do a thing to help you. <laughs> Notice who David was praying to. He didn't go back to the prophet Nathan and said, Nathan, please pray for me. David went down to the ground and he fasted until the Lord answered him and he poured out his heart and this psalm is a reflection of where David was at. He talked to God about that sin. He talked to God in repentance. You got to go to God. You got to be serious. Get your heart has to be right. Amen. You need to seek his mercy. And you have to realize you need his help. If you keep trying to fix yourself or cover things up, it doesn't work. You can't be good on your own. And you can't be joyful on your own. That's, a, that's coming from God. I, I think, uh, well, do you remember the man that was a tax collector and Jesus sees him in the tree, right? And he says, I'm going to dine with you. And everybody hated this guy because he was a real sinner. He stole from people, right? And the guy says, you're coming to my house? <laughs> what? Come on. Jesus is at my, Jesus wants me. He's so excited. He repents of his sins. What did he say? He's going to pay back more than what he stole from yes. people. Yes. See, there was an action. If I've sinned against somebody, I've had to go to my wife and my daughter on times that I have been wrong and I had to ask for their forgiveness. I've had to do it with people in the church. I've had to do it with another pastor. I, I, ooh, ooh, that doesn't feel good. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I realized I messed up with an older pastor. I had to call him. I had to, I did all kinds. I even gave him money. <laughs> I mean, it was in a good way. Not like I'm trying to buy you up. I mean, I meant I'm trying to help. It was an issue he had, and I wanted to show him how much I loved him. Right? So, you know, whether it's someone who's above you or someone you consider lower than you, if you've committed that sin, I know with my daughter, I uh, lost my temper and I had to, I'm not going to retell that whole story, but uh, the Lord <laughs> actually spoke to me and said, do I treat you like that? And, and I had to go to her and, and repent and confess. And, but I can't, I remember the next morning after this, I went to her and I said, I'm sorry. Well, she, <laughs> not ready to, you know, I'm just talking at that point, right? So it's got to be over a period of time where she sees daddy's not freaking out and losing his temper anymore. You got to put that into action. Actions. Actions. And the good thing is, it's not too late. It's never too late. And you can, like uh, David in Psalm 51, 
Now you did it. David Berkowitz, you're in jail. You murdered all these people. But guess what? I'm going to use your testimony, dude. You're going to be leading the Christian fellowship in the prison. And your message is going to go out all over YouTube. And, and, and you're going to help other people. David, you might have wasted. It seems like a waste to other people. It's not a waste to me. This life matters to me, David. You can start over in any capacity, but do you want to? Pride keeps us from confession. Pride keeps us in our sins. We've got to renounce it. So, why don't we pray? Now, you can do this whatever you want. <laughs> you know, you do it here, do it later. You can quiet, you can be loud. It's up to you, God. Uh, but I give us all an opportunity to experience the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and to enter into true repentance with the help of God, not on your own. You're not going to do that on your own. I'm going to pray. You can pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins. Please show them to me. Please show them to me. And help me Help me. Convict, me Convict me to hate them. To hate them. Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, give me a heart of repentance. Give me a, heart of repentance. a true, true conviction of my sins. Lord, help me take that, that video I saw and make it real. The wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Lord, I want to judge myself right now. I don't want to wait until I get into your courtroom. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. And Lord, if it's if it's not just something you want me to say now, but you want me to do, please show me. I believe you, God. That you, you love me. That you forgive me a hundred percent, and will never look at my sin again when I repent. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood that washes me. That washes me. Makes me white. White as snow. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask you to show us now any hidden sin. We want to clean the inside of the cup. And we're going to confess that those who are willing, who want to, God, I pray they will be free and confess those sins to you right now. Thank you, Jesus. And you can come up front if you want to make a... But don't do it just <laughs> for the sake of doing it. But if you really feel you need to get on your knees before God, go ahead. Don't do it as a show, please.
if you need to ask for forgiveness to someone else please don't hesitate either you can do it whenever you want to or now or Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you forgive all sincere repentance and all sincere confessions. And thank you, God, you know that it, it's a process of sanctification, that we're not a complete creature. We're not completely, um, we're not complete in, in this process with you. Uh, but God, we, we do trust you that as we walk this out with you and we deal with the issues you point out to us, God, that we're walking with you. We're working together. We're moving in the right direction in this race. Uh, Lord, we know that you forgive us, that you love us, and you will not remove the, our names from the book of life as we are still in connection with you. But God, we pray, we definitely want to be free of all major sins in our lives that you have pointed out to us. We thank you for your love and your mercy. And your mercy is being new every day, every morning. That's what your word says. That you forgive our sins as far as the east is from the west. You remember them no more. Thank you, Jesus. Before we had you, there was no way to get rid of the weight and guilt of our sins. But we thank you now that we come to you. We come to you and you relieve us of those burdens of Satan and the accusations of guilt and shame and all the depressing thoughts, all the feelings of unworthiness. I release the people in this room in the name of Jesus from the bondage of guilt and shame that is not from God that is not uh, that is a lie of Satan but we receive the conviction of our sins God willingly and we will respond we choose to respond accordingly according to your will in dealing with these situations God and Lord your word said that the church grew in the book of Acts because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit, the fear of the Lord, and the love and comfort of the Holy Spirit. And God, we ask to operate that way in our lives, that we fear you when we have sin, but we are also comforted in your healing power, your love, God, that protects us and draws us closer to you. Thank you for giving us contrite hearts a broken spirit, taking away our pride, disciplining us as a loving father so that we can come to you fully, completely and enjoy our relationship with you. And we choose to judge ourselves now rather than have you judge us later. Thank you, Lord. If anybody does want prayer, please uh, you're welcome to come up. And... and if you need to talk to me later in private, please do that. I mean, some other night or something. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for my sister. Thank you, God. Thank you for her desire 
to repent. And I pray freedom to her in the name of Jesus. Freedom. Freedom. 